are supposed to be. Hmm. There we go. She says she don't like the face. We go in too slow. She wants to walk up ways. So raise the tempo. Cent, five cent, ten cent, dollar. 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 When I thought she had enough and she can't take it grind, she fall. Forget the small change, give me big money wine. This is actually one of my favorite songs from the, uh, well, Kill Me, that was the 80s, this is 1991. I always thought it was from the 80s. I always, it was, whenever I remember it, I remember it as being more 80 something than 1991. But it was always a fun song, you know? And I remember Colin Lucas in the little cycling shorts. All I remember when cycling shorts was the rage. And everybody was wearing cycling shorts. You're going out to all kind of event, all kind of fat and thing. And you're putting on a cycling shorts. I mean, would anybody put on cycling shorts and a t-shirt or cycling shorts and a blouse now to go out anywhere? I certainly wouldn't. But yeah, that was rage back then to put on a pair of cycling shorts and, and go on, you know, willy willy yourself and thing. So good evening. Hi to everybody. So folks, usually I would have a guest for a program like this. And I had invited my cousin who is, as you know, a former um, minister of trade. Good Lord, there's so many different things he was minister of. Because I regularly um, tease him and call him, you know, if, you know, a minister of everything like Stuart Young. Um, but he was a minister in the Ministry of Finance. He functioned as a the Ministry of Trade in the Ministry of Trade and Investment, and I think he also did stuff in in the Ministry of Planning and in, and, and Development. But I was trying to get him on, and then what happened was he had agreed on everything, and the problem was power. Electricity went by him, and so with electricity having gone by him, he does not have a stable internet connection. Um, we didn't really want to do it just off his phone because when you're doing it off the phone, phone calls and things just disturb and it just, it is just better to, to come into a virtual studio off a Wi-Fi as opposed to off a phone data. So he can't be here, but that I mean, we're not going to have a conversation about the budget. So we are going to have a conversation about the budget. I guess this might be the point where I'm supposed to slow down and stop and tell all you build the live, build the live, build the live. So, hi Debbie, hi Christopher, hi Anne, hi Jazzy, hi Paula, um, hi Daryl, Fabian, Janelle, Raylene, Marva, Paul, Chris, Balcaran, Michael, Danny, how you doing my darling, Keon, Jack, Billy Bob, Len Lees, um, Ramola, Hazel, Anna Sedeno, hi, 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 hi. So, I'm going to talk about the budget with you all and I'm going to talk to you all about the budget because like most of you, I think certainly most of you that follow me on, on, on this live, because I'm, I'm one of the things I've noticed is that I have a very high caliber of followers, the kinds of conversations you all have, the kinds of debates, the kinds of discussions that take place, um, tells me that many of you are following the issues in much the same way that I am following the issues. And many of you make the effort to, you know, figure things out for yourself. So I follow the budget, I pay attention to the budget, and I'm well aware that what a budget really is, is a balancing act on a regular basis. And whether you're looking at the budget from the macro level of the national budget that is going to be read tomorrow at half past one, or if you're looking at a budget on the micro level, like, you know, household budgets and, and company budgets and things, it's still balancing. You're looking at how much money you're getting, how much money you're making, how much money you're generating, and then... How much money you have to spend and of course you're spending in different ways on different things with our budget the majority of our revenue comes from i don't know if any if any of you all believe it or would know it where where do we get the majority of our revenue from so we have another q and a right now i'm actually functioning like i am genuinely in a classroom with you all so i'm waiting to hear all you where do we genuinely get our revenue from? Where, where, is the, where does our revenue come from? 
I wonder how many people know. Because I think that for the most part, we tend to think that all of our revenue just comes from oil, from selling oil, right? But our revenue, Tisha Marie, it comes from the energy sector, but we think that it comes from selling oil. It really comes from the taxes that we get from the oil companies. So it's energy sector, yes, but it's really taxes it's not, it's not just on selling oil and gas the way we think. We think that we are selling oil and gas, but it comes from royalties and taxes based on the energy sector. And then, of course, we have a whole bunch of places that we, there are lots of different taxes. So taxes make up 90% of our revenue. So I spent some time today as plenty fool and learning like some of the new arm. Um, features well not new features so many features of this software that i have um it, that it has so we have a whole bunch of taxes not just energy taxes i should have put energy taxes up inside there but we have a whole bunch of taxes that we use for revenue earning so corporation tax personal tax like pay va value added tax motor vehicle tax business levy green fund stamp duty import duty excise insurance premium and then eventually property tax what used to be land and building taxes and um gambling taxes those things are coming in right so there are a number of ways in which we generate revenue through taxes but how our revenue is generated here is through taxation and royalties so we get now the majority of the revenue comes from the energy sector but it's not from just selling oil and gas it's not like we go and we just sell we are getting it from taxes that we charge to the energy companies right so if petrotrin selling oil and gas and petrotrain and like ngc and M. yes we're making money from selling from from selling oil and gas that way but for the bps and the bgs and the bhp billetons and them that are here we tax those companies because remember those companies are here drilling for oil in our country right on our land in our land and down in our seabed so they pay us royalties and they pay us taxes. We get taxes based on um, how much oil they produce, how much, well, let me just say how much fuel they extract, not just on, not just on profits alone, but on how much they extract, right? So that's how we earn revenue. So that's a list of the taxes. I really should, I should amend it. Let me amend it and put energy let me just uh, just make a, a change save it boom there we go all right so energy sectors energy sector taxes and corporation tax all of those things so that's how we make revenue and then after we have earned our revenue, and another and, and a, an important thing for you to know is this. We collect revenue at different times of the year. So quarterly. But there are different months that where the there are different months for collecting um, income tax and energy royalty and all of all of those things, right? So at different times of the year, in different months, our border inland revenue, and I guess eventually revenue authority, collect these taxes and the collection of these taxes and when they collect the taxes is what helps the economy keep going so tomorrow when all you see um the minister of finance the master of coin get up and go and stand up at the podium to start to read the budget pay attention to how much money in taxes we have collected that's one of the things that you should pay attention to. And you should also note, I'm sure most of you know, there was, there was a tax amnesty on. 
pa- I'm sure the majority of the reason there was a tax amnesty on and they extended the tax amnesty as many times as they extended it uh, up to yesterday I see there is a final extension that is going down until October the 15th it would be to allow the Board of Inland Revenue to be able to collect revenue because when you're collecting taxes you're collecting revenue and remember we are in a situation where we are short on having collected revenues and you constantly have things like salaries and bills to pay on a regular basis right yes Celise, the, 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 the tax amnesty is still on because i saw the i saw the, the the notice yesterday so you have this tax amnesty that is going on until um until the 15th of october and it's going to allow persons who have any number of those taxes there to be able to go and pay up their taxes to the state to avoid penalties right and i think to avoid having to pay um further interest on on any taxes that they that they are owing the um that they owe in the government so that's how we earn revenue well at least that's one of the major ways we earn revenue we earn revenue through taxation you can also earn revenue through the sale of assets Anybody here remembers when we were trying to sell Petrotrin refinery? I will be careful to not say trying to sell Petrotrin because we were not trying to sell Petrotrin. Right? So we were trying to sell the refinery. And we were trying to sell the refinery as in the government, the state, the country was trying to sell the refinery in order to earn money. So when you have assets and there are assets that are not earning you any money, or their assets that might be draining your pocket rather than putting money in your pocket what you attempt to do is sell the asset like some of them might have more than one vehicle or sometimes you might have if you're like me multiple devices right so you have two three laptops and you mightn't be using all of the laptops so when you realize here now i have plenty gadgets and devices and i ain't using all of these gadgets and devices let me find people who need these gadgets and devices and sell it to them possibly at a reduced price or maybe at the market price or whatever depending of course on the condition it's in so it's kind of similar i'm just using it as an analogy for what went on with petrotrin the refinery i mean so there's the refinery the refinery was costing the country costing the government more money than it was making because to be able to run the refinery especially since um the at that point in time they were saying that the machinery inside of the refinery was old it's very old and needed a lot of um maintenance and upkeep and repairs and stuff so the attempt was at that point in time to sell the refinery to be able to make back money on that from that asset so when you when you have assets you can sell the assets to be able to make money or another way the government has made money is not necessarily from not like an outright sale of their assets but you all remember clico the clico that we spend hoto to money on to to bail out like i think it's about 30 billion dollars that was the last figure i heard right 30 billion dollars um to to um to bail out clico well the state would have held on to Clico's assets as part of the bailout arrangement. And when the state held on to Clico's assets, one of the things they did, if I'm not mistaken, it happened in 2017. I remember it happening, but I'm not 100% certain if the year was 2017 or 2018. Might have been, might have been 2018. In 2018, they would the government would have taken all of the clico assets and put the assets in a fund called the national investment fund and then sold shares to the fund so you could have invested in the assets for that the, the assets that are in that fund so the clico assets were placed in a fund and the government sold shares to that fund and so people who purchase shares in that fund managed to do two things one they would have been investing because of course the fund is making money right so you're getting dividends from the fund and in having in in having bought the shares in the fund it also allowed the government to raise money so to the best of my knowledge 
the government has raised or earned six billion dollars in total because the first year in 2018 when they when they sold the shares when they when they had the fund the first time around um and and offered sales of shares i think they made four billion dollars off the fund in in 2018 and then recently earlier earlier this year like about a month or two ago i saw an ad in the papers saying that the fund had since 2018 to now it had made two billion dollars more so six billion dollars in in all in terms of profit right so those are some of the ways in which the government can raise money can earn revenue through taxes through sale of assets another way to get revenue or to get money i think it would be called non-taxable income is through borrowing Dan Rad Sergio, calm down. We don't really deal up with people being abusive in the middle of a chat thread, in, a, in the middle of a comment thread here. So calm down. Whatever is going on there with you, calm down. Maybe you want to go to another page, but this is not the page to be carrying on like that. Right. So, boom, close that off. So, another way to earn money. Is through borrowing so how do we borrow because the thing is once you're borrowing hey Andre how are you doing once you are borrowing money you have loans to pay and it's technically us the taxpayers who paying those loans off because the money the revenue that is being earned off us through taxes some of that gets allocated to us debt servicing so it's very important for us to pay attention to how many loans our government taking from various lending agencies, right? Whether it's from the, whether it's the IMF, um, whether it's um, the Andean Bank. I mean, there are lots of different ways because I think the IADB, right, is another, another avenue. But you have loans. How do we access those loans? We access those loans based on the buffers we have, based on the savings we have, right? And if you have savings, so let's use, let's use, you know, you, you regular persons. Let's say Tisha Marie Dale, because I see in Tisha Marie comments, something coming up. I see in Tisha Marie, Tisha Marie name regularly. Let us say Tisha Marie has property. Let us say she owns property. Let us say Tisha Marie has um, a unit trust account or something like that. So, right? And in that account, she has savings. She has reserves in that account. I don't know if Trish, Tisha Marie have a unit trust account, right? But I see in Tisha Marie and I feel I could, you know, call she name and thing. I could actually add her to the broadcast. Tisha Marie, did you know that? That if I want to, I can click on add to broadcast and, I, and you would just be part of the live. So, let us say Tisha Marie has... Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, a unit trust account or she has a fixed deposit or something like that so but she ain't touching it she don't want to break it at all so she has the money there she can get a loan based on the money that she has in that account right and her bank might say to her okay all right you have forty thousand dollars in this account i have no idea if she has that and i'm not saying that she has that i'm using that as a hypothetical figure you have this amount of reserves and because you have this amount of reserves, we could give you a loan based on this amount of reserves. And we could give you a loan based on the amount of reserves that you have and the earning power that you have in terms of what it is you're doing when the day come. And that allows you to be able to borrow money. So we have foreign reserves. And this is how much foreign reserves we have. And the foreign reserves is in US, right? It's not in TT dollars. So you're looking at, we have $7 billion in US, in, 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 in reserve in US, in, we have $7 billion in US reserves. We have $6 billion in the Heritage and Stabilization Fund. And we have $3.5 billion in commercial banks, right? So based on the reserves that we have 
and based on how much money we can generate like the, how much money they forecast we can earn based on our energy reserves here the government can actually go to various banks right like the andean bank and the inter-american development bank and and borrow money or get loans and grants based on projects right but again against the background of the reserves that we have so why am i telling you all of this i'm telling you all of this so that you understand how exactly things like revenue and expenditure work so the revenue oh i should talk about the heritage and stabilization fund but there's a little video clip that i want to play further down um that will help me to elaborate a little bit better on the heritage and stabilization fund because it, when when um when vasan said to me that he couldn't make it onto the program this evening i felt that i needed to go and like listen and read a little bit more about a couple of things before i could come on here and there was an interview with the minister of finance from the midterm review of the budget that i was listening to and in listening to the interview i felt that there were some interesting questions um, that he answered in an interview and so I made some clips and I feel we should listen to listen to some of it just to be able to understand things but no Debbie we had to talk about the Heritage and Stabilization Fund you know why because them just lie about the Heritage and Stabilization Fund all the time the minute you talk about the Heritage and Stabilization Fund the United National Congress talks about it as if it is being raided right left right and center and what becomes clear to me is that the opposition deliberately misleads its followers about how the Heritage and Stabilization Fund works. First of all, the Heritage and Stabilization Fund gets serviced based on energy prices. It gets serviced based on how much, how much revenue you think you project you are going to earn from energy prices and then if you earn more money off your energy um, or off your energy reserves than you than you projected you are going to earn you get that excess money goes right goes into the heritage and stabilization fund to service it let me see if I could break it down easier although I feel my audience understands how the HSF works I know the UNC audience don't understand how the heritage and stabilization fund works and I suspect it's because they don't do enough investment and legitimate banking. Because once you are doing regular investments and, le and regular legitimate banking, it's not difficult to understand how the Heritage and Stabilization Fund works. I have... I have money that i invested in a fund so let me use myself as a for example right i have money that i invested in a fund now if i make a certain amount of revenue when the month come or if i project if I work out and say okay all right i'm looking to make five thousand dollars this month and you see if i make more than five thousand dollars this month the excess money that I make, that going to go into this account that I have, right? And it is an account that is an account that I have there where I just save in money. So whatever excess I make, I just it just going into that account. And it going into that account for a rainy day. But here how the account does work. I put in money into it from me making excess, from me earning excess revenue. And... The fund in and of itself does earn money. So if a month come and I fall short, I could get, I could draw down on that account. I'm not drawing down on the principal, I'm drawing down on the interest. So the Heritage and Stabilization Fund is a fund that our government, however many decades ago, would have invested in. And a lump sum of money would have been placed into it. And the way the fund works is, if every year how we earn more from revenue than we projected we were going to earn the extra money the extra that we have earned 
right then goes into the fund to top up the fund and the fund in and of itself because it is part of an investment program the fund makes money so it generates interest it generates income and when we need money from the fund we draw down but we draw down on the to the best of my knowledge we, we draw down on the interest i don't think we drawing down on the principal so we're not going in and taking away from what was originally placed there it's from the it's from the interest so that's how the heritage and stabilization fund works so there's a lot of rolling over of money so it what <clears throat> what happens once we are in a position where we are earning and we are earning properly with respect to energy prices then the fund gets serviced if we are earning less than we projected to earn the fund doesn't get service so it is not a situation where you had to go and find money to put money into the heritage and stabilization fund it is based on the projected earnings from the energy sector right so when the united national congress decides that they're going to carry on like full idiots over the heritage and stabilization fund tell them hold up or they don't understand how banking does work or at least or they don't seem to understand how legitimate banking does work right so the drawdowns are from interest earned and what happens is or, or rather i should say not what happens is that's part of that's part of our laws you know like it's actually part of how the fund works you are allowed to draw down on the interest from the fund and the purpose of drawing down on the interest from the fund is for rainy day purposes natural disasters and that's what the fund was created to be used for it was created to be there when we have need for money now in the last year uh, with this pandemic so year year and some right because we this is the second pandemic budget that we're going into now um in the last so in, in in the last budget and in in i guess maybe in this budget to come certainly last year's budget and when imbert spoke at the midterm review of the budget he would have pointed out that the drawdown from the heritage and stabilization fund was to allow the government to be able to continue to pay bills right and this is the thing that has me concerned it is almost as if they don't understand or they don't listen to or they don't pay attention to what the heritage and stabilization fund money has been used for right because the government here is the employer of 60 percent of the workforce if the government was to decide that it's not going to ensure that there is money in the treasury to pay salaries only understand what taking place here if 60 percent of this of the population can't get a salary do you know what that means for people for for rents for banks for groceries for stores right stop and think for a minute our public service that's 60% of the workforce right the public service is 60% of the workforce so stop and think for two seconds if 60% of the workforce didn't get salary in one month because most persons live in month to month right or I, or I should say plenty people especially people who work in any public sector you're working you live in month to month you might have a couple months of savings in your bank somewhere might might have a couple months of savings but for the most part most persons i know just be looking forward to that salary at month end time because they they live in month to month right so if the government didn't put itself in a position where it could pay its salaries pay its bills every month certainly make sure that it pay people's salary and people pension at the end of every month what do you think would have happened what what do you think would happen nobody will be able to go to the groceries so the groceries will feel that pinch 
nobody will be able to pay their mortgage so banks will feel that pinch so things like mortgage and your car loan and them kind of all of those things so when you have people existing paycheck to paycheck in a particular you have to make sure as a government that you have money in your treasury to pay salaries on a monthly basis and that's what the heritage and stabilization fund drawdown this year with the pandemic was used for i'm seeing randy ram singh saying their laws governing how it should use so randy i yes there are laws governing how it should be used as a matter of fact it's there in the constitution it explains to you exactly how you can go about drawing down you can't just draw down willy-nilly you can't wake up this month and decide that you're drawing down there are specific times for when you can draw down and when the money is drawn down it goes straight into the consolidated fund and the minister of finance explains what the money was being used for but since you say but he didn't explain what the money was being used for let me see if i could find a video wherein he explains it um is it i think it's this one yes no so let's listen to this i listen to this um conversation here where am I? Just now. That's not what I want. Oops. Right. There we go. Good afternoon. Um, Alicia Boucher from TV6. Minister, I just want to ask um, two simple questions. The first is, are we in a recession? Are we heading towards a recession based on the figures that you are presenting? and the second question is what plans what are the plans that what are the plans that we have for um replenishing the drawdowns that we've had to use from the heritage and stabilization fund and the time frame within which we will be able to replenish that fund with respect to the first question i'm simply reporting that the actual revenue we've received is about 13% less than we expected it to be. Uh, some of the sectors of the economy are doing quite well. Uh, the non-oil sector is doing quite well. So I, I, I wouldn't want to speculate at this point in time as to whether we're in a recession or not. I mean, the economy went way down with COVID and the entire world expects all economies to, to, to rise back up from that low level. So I, I wouldn't want to comment on that at this point in time. With respect to your other question, I don't think you, you fully understand how deposits are made to the Heritage and Stabilization Fund. That fund receives surplus petroleum revenues. So if you have a projection as to petroleum revenues that you expect to get over fiscal year. You all heard it, right? You all heard it. Let me let him, let me let him finish, explain. And you get much more than you anticipated then you take the surplus and you put it in the fund. We're in a situation now where petroleum revenues are much less than we thought they would be, and therefore there's no surplus to put in the fund. It's as simple as that. So the fund will not be replenished by deposits. The fund is growing from, believe it or not, the performance of the stock market over the last six months. In fact, it's done very, very well. We took a billion dollars US out of that fund over the last 12 months or so and the value in the fund dropped just by a couple hundred million dollars because it grew through returns from the stocks and the other instruments the bonds and equities and so on that the fund is is, is built up on it's earning believe it or not that fund is earning between three and five hundred million us dollars a year from the assets in the fund so the fund itself is generating income from it from its own assets but in terms of deposits, that can't happen. Not in a situation where revenues from petroleum are much less than expected. Were you all able to hear the entire thing? Because I saw some person saying that they weren't hearing properly. So just let me know. As a matter of fact, you know what? I could I could rewind and, and have him explain. 
I seen Holly saying bring Minister Imbert on a live. Only know how long I begging Minister Imbert to come and do a live, and so he bus in style. But let me replay this for you. Yeah. And you get much more than you anticipate. Actually, pause. Let me go back even more because I find this was a really good explanation about how the fund works. So replenish that fund. With respect to the first question, I'm simply reporting that the actual revenue we've received is about 13% less than we expected it to be. Uh, some of the sectors of the economy are doing quite well. Uh, the non-oil sector is doing quite well. So I, I, I wouldn't want to speculate at this point in time as to whether we're in a recession or not. I mean, the economy went way down with COVID and the entire world expects all economies to, to, to rise back up from that low level. So I, I wouldn't want to comment on that at this point in time. With respect to your other question, I don't think you fully understand how deposits are made to the Heritage and Stabilization Fund. That fund receives surplus petroleum revenues. So if you have a projection as to petroleum revenues that you expect to get over fiscal year, and you get much more than you anticipated, then you take the surplus and you put it in the fund. We're in a situation now where petroleum revenues are much less than we thought they would be, and therefore there's no surplus to put in the fund. It's as simple as that. So the fund will not be replenished by deposits. The fund is growing from, believe it or not, the performance of the stock market over the last six months. In fact, it's done very, very well. We took a billion dollars US out of that fund over the last 12 months or so, and the value in the fund dropped just by a couple hundred million dollars because it grew through returns from the stocks and the other instruments, the bonds and equities and so on that the fund is, is, is built up on. It's earning, believe it or not, that fund is earning between three and 500 million US dollars a year from the assets in the fund. So the fund itself is generating income from, it, from its own assets. But in terms of deposits, that can't happen. Not in a situation where revenues from petroleum are much less than expected. So he explains it, and he explains it very smoothly, very, very easily there, that how the HSF makes money is from revenue from petroleum. And it's based on projected revenue. And of course, projected revenue means that you have to be talking about things like... Um, because I kind of on the loud side. Eh? It means that you have to be talking about things like energy prices. So I went and I was looking at energy prices today and was checking out was checking out what the energy prices look like today. Let me um let me pull it up. And just surely what energy prices looking like today. Come on. Hmm. There was um just now. Ah, I remember what I searched for. I searched for WTI. That's it. WTI prices. Let me pull it up. So that's what energy that's th this is what energy price is looking like right now, right? So about $75 for a bar that's a barrel of crude. And to my understanding, um gas prices are also up. They are 3 is $3 right now as opposed 3 US dollars as opposed to to 2 US dollars, which is what it was around last year. Now, the important thing of course is this pandemic so this pandemic has happened and in the in in the course of the pandemic you're now in a situation where movement has has been on the decline and with movement being on the decline and a lot of our revenue having to go towards purchasing vaccines and also making sure the parallel health healthcare system is up and running and running efficiently that means that money has had to be diverted 
The other thing too is there are lot many sectors for a significant part of last year and this year there were a number of sectors that were shut down and people were just not allowed to be able to do things in a particular way. So casinos have been closed for however long. Uh, members clubs have been closed for however long. Daycare centers have been closed since the pandemic started. Schools have had schools were for a very long time functioning virtually. So whether they were private schools or public schools, they were functioning virtually. Private schools, I guess, would have started back up faster and continued functioning in a particular way versus public schools. And there, but the overall point I'm trying to make is there was a lot of slowdown and because there was a lot of slowdown there was also a lot of contracted spending so people haven't been spending in the same way and of course if you're not spending in the same way that means that your economy has become very sluggish but i wanted you to listen to this bit here where he talks about energy and energy prices um based on a question that curtis williams would have asked him all right Sectors including um, taxes Oops, on property. Let me let's start from the because I you you've you've pointed about the shortfall in revenue um, from all sectors, including um, taxes on profits and so on. With the COVID nineteen having hit um, since March in terms of Trent Tobago, wasn't it reasonable to expect that um, there would have been um, significant um, significant shortfall? in those in profits um from different companies and perhaps you should have been a little more conservative um in your in your projections so tomorrow when we're listening to the budget we need to listen to what he's projecting revenue will be right and by that what he's projecting energy prices are going to be based on crude figures and based on gas figures that is going to be very 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 important so here minister imbert is going to talk about how he went about projecting and what went on with energy prices right uh, that's the first question the second question is um, with respect to the oil and gas um, particularly the performance of the of the um, gas companies um, would you would you see uh, can you explain what could be done to increase production or is it at this stage uh, government is really um, helpless in, in doing that? With respect to the first question, as I've told you before, I just want to reiterate that when we do the budget exercise, because uh, energy sector revenue is such a large part of revenue, we interrogate the Ministry of Energy just to make sure that the information we are getting is as accurate as it possibly can. And we, there are a number of areas that you get revenue from the energy sector, such as taxes on incomes and profits, royalties, supplemental petroleum tax, um, the other small taxes like the unemployment levy, the oil impost, and so on. The, what has happened is that there were projections, and this is not just from the Ministry of Energy, but also from the various um, energy forecasting organizations, such as the Energy Information Administration of the United States, the World Bank, the IMF, the European um, forecasters that forecast oil prices and so on. There were projections of uh, price for natural gas going into uh, 2021 post COVID of somewhere in the vicinity of in excess of three dollars that has not happened that the, the the gas price that we have received is significantly below that three dollar but when you do your estimates you have to base it on information you receive from the experts so that we based our estimates of price after interrogating the officials on the the figures produced by that ministry and i can tell you as i told you before that the original estimates of revenue we got from the Ministry of Energy were not, in my opinion, uh, realistic. They were a bit too high, so we cut them down. 
but with, as we go down now into the first part of this fiscal year, we realize the price we're getting is not what was projected, not just here, but abroad. But production is being severely affected. And I did some... And I feel that's a valid point that was made there. And it's a point that gets, um, that gets lost. Because we tend to talk about energy only in terms of prices, right? We're consistently talking about the price of energy, the price of energy, the price of energy. But we're not talking about the production of energy, one. And we're also not talking about who is using the energy that we are producing. Because there are a number of countries globally that are now moving away from fossil fuel. There are many, many countries now that have decided what they're doing is trying to use more sustainable um, types of energy, whether it's solar energy, hydro energy, wind. And so because there are those changes and there are those shifts and markets are beginning to move differently and production is also an issue, you will find that the revenue that we are making off energy changes right and may well be fluctuating so when we're hearing conversations about energy start also looking at what is going on with clean energy right sustainable and um sustainable energies and sustainable more sustainable practices and also which markets are still using um crude crude energy right so those those are some of the things that 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 we need to be thinking about and, and talking about when we're listening to the Minister of Finance discuss energy and energy issues. Because remember what I was saying early on when we were talking about revenue, how we earn a lot of our revenue here, the majority of our revenue here is through taxes and the taxes on energy um, and on energy taxes and energy royalty. So we need to be mindful of wh what is going on with not just fossil fuel energy but also sustainable energy and tisha marie absolutely right fossil fuel energy is important to us because it because it is subsidized here right what what we pay for for gas gasoline here we the rest of the world that's not how they that's not the kind of prices that they pay for for energy we only talk about oil and gas here in other parts of the world people are talking about other kinds of energy because oil and gas are expensive for them and because we actually need these other markets to purchase our oil and gas so if these other markets have decided that what they're going to be doing is finding other kinds of energy that will have less impact and will be easy on their pockets it means they're not buying our oil and gas so think about that right pay attention so there's at least one other um where he talks about he's going to be talking about borrowing here and i want to hear what he had to say about um borrowing what? Uh, borrowing money because remember i was talking about us borrowing money do, do, do. are the mechanisms that um that government has uh, available especially uh, let's forget that's um the well hsf and well, I, IDB, all these other um, mechanisms, me mechanisms. What kind of mechanisms would we have to, to actually continue borrowing? And can the country afford that excess debt at this point in time? Yeah, there are three ways you can get um, non tax revenue. Borrowing is one, obviously. In our case, we are fortunate we have a heritage fund. It's still close to $6 billion US dollars after all this time. And all these financial problems we've had because it has performed so well. I think it's 5.8 billion is one is the last figure I saw last week. So you can continue to withdraw from the fund in a reasonable, measured, you know, professional, mature way. You can borrow both locally and internationally. We still have a fairly good credit rating, so people are willing to lend the country money. And then you can sell state assets. This is not a time to sell state assets. This is not a... Uh, a All right, I've seen some people saying that the volume is low. So let me raise this up. Oh God, hard in my ears. And let you all listen to the question again. Available, especially, uh, let's forget, let's, um, the well, HSF and well, I, IDB, all these other um, mechanisms, mechanisms. What kind of mechanisms would we have 
to, to actually continue borrowing? And can the country afford that excess debt at this point in time? Yeah, there are three ways you can get um, non-tax revenue. Borrowing is one, obviously. In our case, we are fortunate we have a heritage fund. It's still close to $6 billion US dollars after all this time. And all these financial problems we've had because it has performed so well. I think it's $5.8 billion is what it is the last figure I saw last week. So you can continue to withdraw from the fund in a reasonable, measured, you know, professional, mature way. You can borrow both locally and internationally. We still have a fairly good credit rating, so people are willing to lend the country money. And then you can sell state assets. This is not a time to sell state assets. This is not a, a, a seller's market. This is a buyer's market. So if you went to market now to try and dispose of state assets, you wouldn't get value for them. So we will have to look at borrowing and withdrawals from the heritage fund, as well as containing expenditure. Even the IMF has said, if you if you read the international publications, even the IMF has said that this is a time for countries to borrow money. All of the traditional frameworks and metrics and ways of measuring what your debt to GDP ratio should be, that is all gone out the window with COVID. Of course, the rating agencies will be very uh, strict in the way they look at these things. But I mean, you take the United Kingdom, debt to GDP crossed a hundred percent just like right so he talks there about various ways for raising money and he of course points to the ability to borrow and the fact that you know once and we talked about that just a couple minutes ago once you have those reserves against those reserves you can go and you can borrow money now that's the revenue aspect of things and we've touched a little bit on the expenditure, what money is spent on. Money is here spent mostly on salaries um, and, uh, of course, things like pensions and grants and, and that. And then, of course, there's the regular bill paying that the ministry, that the government has to do. Um, yet, you're not just paying salaries, maintenance, upkeep, their projects, all of those things. So now this brings us to the question of diversification. Now, diversification is a conversation we've been having for decades. And I think many of us talk about diversification and we maybe we've lost sight of when exactly or how exactly diversification has taken place here. Because we tend to say that no diversification has taken place in Trinidad and Tobago. But I'm going to tell you, that's a lie. That's not the case. Kearney 1975 Limited was one of our biggest diversification projects here. And that's a situation where you had the state pouring tens of billions of dollars into the agricultural, uh, agricultural sector, right? Because we would have, the country would have purchased um, the Kearney lands from Tate and Lyle. And then that entire project would have been invested in, in a particular way to allow for agriculture to allow for um, a certain amount of agro-processing and diversification, not just sugar, sugar, citrus, the buffalipso, um, milk products. So there was there was diversification through Kearney 1975 Limited. Then, of course, the Point Lisas Industrial Estate, right? So the Point Lisas Industrial Estate is another way in which money or, reven or money from energy revenue was then used to... Um, to, 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 to lead to diversification in other sectors. I see Tisha Marie pointing out rice. You are correct. I'd forgotten that rice was one of the ways in which we were diversifying. Um, forest trees, that's another way we diversified. And I am trying to... Oh, it, it's Scott, it's Pat. I don't know how many persons here from Central Trinidad. I am from Central Trinidad. So I know about the Iron and Steel, <laughs> the Iron and Steel Company of Trinidad and Tobago because I went to school with a number of girls whose fathers were um, part and parcel of the whole Escot Espat um, infrastructure. So there are a number of things that were done with energy money, right, to lead to diversification. We were supposed to have um, eventually set up a smelter the smelter didn't take place um did it, it it didn't happen you know for a range of reasons 
And then the creative sector, there were a number of um, programs that were set up to fund filmmaking, fashion, um, and, 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 you know, entrepreneurial um, pursuits within the creative, within the, 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 the creative um, industries. Some of those things bore fruit. Many of those things did not bear fruit. And some of the questions you have to ask yourself when you're talking about economic diversification is whether or not or how much um, money those sectors eventually added to our GDP, right? Gross domestic product. Now, the energy sector has always been the biggest contributor to our gross domestic product, right? To, to our GDP. After that is the manufacturing sector. And then after the manufacturing sector, there'd be some other smaller sectors that would be um, contributing to our GDP. Diversification at this point in time, for me, just looking on, I'm wondering, that's a bit of a tricky and sticky situation. Because where are you going to get the money from to invest in and to develop other sectors? Also, and for me, there's a crucial point to make at, at this point in time. Diversification doesn't fall under the Ministry of Finance. It's a conversation that we actually need to have with the Minister of Trade and Investment because economic diversification, that's actually her portfolio, right? So it's one of the reasons I want to try and get Paula Gopi Schoon here so that she can talk about what kind of economic diversification plans are in the pipeline via her, via her, um, her ministry. Now I know that there's a, I know that there are a number of projects happening in agriculture. Friday evening, we would have had uh, Minister Rambrat here talking about some of the projects. But I know there's a Maruga Hill Rise project, for instance. And for the longest while, I've been telling myself I have to bring um, the owner of um, that company here on News Source to talk about what exactly he has been doing and how he started up the company. And because he's on, you know, he's beginning to export the Hill Rice and, you know, making an impact in the diaspora so parts of the united states have they have the hill rise and of course it's in it is it's in in supermarkets here but the manufacturing sector is an important and interesting sector and i am hoping that in the budget tomorrow we hear about those other sectors and what those other sectors are contributing and then of course begin a conversation but as i was thinking yeah yes damien mark forgeny as i was thinking about diversification this evening I started thinking about it and applying it to myself, right? So I have been working in education for the majority of my adult life. I worked in media for a period of time, then moved from media to working in education. And I worked in secondary education, tertiary education. So I'm thinking of myself, well, how do I go about diversifying my portfolio? And I was thinking about myself in relation to our country. Because I've worked in education for 20 years. The majority of my adult life, I have been in education. How do I now, after 20 years, that's where, that's how I make my money. That's how I earn my income. That's how I generate all of my revenue. How do I go about pivoting? Because I'm thinking our government, our country, we've been earning our revenue off the energy sector for more than six decades, right? For actually, for uh, I would easily say we've been, the majority of our revenue has been from the energy sector for close to a century. So when you have been reliant on one sector, one way of making money your entire life or the majority of your existence, how do you then diversify? How do you branch out to do other things and training and education becomes important. So I would be very interested in hearing what they are planning to do in terms of training and educating the workforce for the purpose of diversification. Because you see, it's one thing to talk about diversifying the economy. But if and when you diversify an economy and you start building different sectors or developing different sectors, where and how are you finding the human resource to be able to populate those sectors? Minister Rambarat on 
Friday evening, talked about a lot of interesting things going on in agriculture, right? And I was thinking to myself, how many of us here, how many of you here that are sitting here listening to, listening to this program, how many of you are actually prepared, if it came to it, to stop what you're doing and turn to using agriculture? Like, because uh, there's also a story in the, in the papers today where the Minister of Planning and Development says that more money, a, a, a lot of focus is going to be p um, f placed on agriculture. But how many of us are prepared to focus on agriculture? Like, do you have the tools? Me, I don't have the tools. Like, I don't have the skill set to, like, I mean, I know how to wet plants. But to say, start a farm, run a farm, I don't have those skills. So I would have to learn. I would have to be prepared to retrain myself and to learn how to make that shift. And it's the same thing I'm thinking when we start talking about digitization and increased use of technology and making more services be available um, online or virtually. How many of us are trained, prepared, have the skills to be able to do those things and to enter into a diversified economy that is more digital? So that for me is really important tomorrow i'd want to hear or in the next coming weeks i'd want to hear what is being said about preparing and training and retooling the adult population for these new sectors and it's one thing for the state to provide the avenues and then of course the next thing is for people to avail themselves of the avenues so that's what, you know, that's what I wanted to talk to you about for a couple minutes this evening. The budget, how our budget works and what this pandemic would mean for us at this point in time and how we go about diversifying. To be able to diversify, we have to have, we have, to have a workforce that's trained and ready to get into new sectors. To be able to b develop those new sectors, we got to have the money to be able to um to be able to develop those new sectors so it'll be interesting tomorrow to listen to where we are financially in terms of our money our reserves our um revenue how much we revenue we've collected and also what we have to spend money on and how much money is going to be spent on each sector so i'm hoping that you all look at the budget tomorrow evening um it's starting at half past one on ttt and um, we will have a conversation later on in the week, if not Wednesday, certainly by Friday, we will have a conversation about you know the major highlights coming out of um, coming out of the the budget. I'm seeing Jennifer saying, "How much training do I want?" Um, Jennifer, I'm going to say this. I am aware that the government has. Um, I'm aware that the government has poured a lot of energy into training. That there are lots of programs that people can take can take advantage of, and I think um, m a lot of the population don't. D we just don't pay attention to the various programs and that are available to us, and we don't we don't take them up. So yes, we should be taking up the programs, and yes, we should be making an effort. <laughs> we should be making an effort to retrain, to retool to get ourselves ready for a different sort of existence because this pandemic has changed um this pandemic has changed how we live this pandemic has changed how we spend i don't think anybody from march of last year to now is spending in the same way i think we have all spent differently i think we have all taught thought about money um in a different way I think we are all thinking about how we spend time and resources in a different way. I know I certainly am, right? I know because of the pandemic, because I have had to work from home, because I've had to work virtually, I've had to learn a whole new set of skills. I've had to learn how to use technology in a more engaging way. And I've used that technology to be able to earn, uh, make a living for the for the last um, 18 years. 18 19 months and even though i continue to earn a salary i have had 
to think very differently about how I'm spending money because I was consistently concerned that at any point in time, I might be laid off, I might not have my, my contracts renewed, and I might not necessarily be in a position to exist for however long without being paid a salary. So I started eating differently, <laughs> and making purchases differently. There are a lot of things that I would have bought freely prior to the pandemic that I am not, I just not buying freely anymore, right? So I hope that you all picked up something today about budgets and how budgets work and we'll listen to the budget tomorrow and um, come away from it, you know, a little bit more informed. So enjoy the rest of all your evening and we will, um, we go talk soon, right? Oh, that is loud. All right, y'all take care.